Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the seventh in the National Archives online evening lecture series for 2021. My name is Elizabeth McAvoy, and I'm the archivist with responsibility for education and outreach in the National Archives. And on behalf of the office, we're delighted to welcome you here tonight on one of the most important dates in Ireland's cultural calendar, Culture Night. There's always plenty of talks and events to choose from this evening. So we're particularly pleased that you've chosen to join us in the National Archives for our Culture Night talk. And we'd like to extend an especially warm welcome and a Cade Mila Falcha to all who are tuning in from across the world. We're also delighted to welcome our guest speaker, Tony Hennessy, who will present on how to create your family tree. But before we begin, I'd just like to go through a few housekeeping details so that you can engage with our event. Audience cameras are off and mics are on mute, but we encourage your active participation in tonight's talk using the webinar's Q&A function. Tony's talk will run for roughly 45 to 50 minutes with time for Q&A at the end. You'll have the opportunity to submit your questions during the talk. So please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen there as the chat box is disabled. We'll accommodate as many questions as time permits. So apologies in advance if we don't get around to answering yours. We're recording this webinar and we'll make it available on our website shortly, as we've already done with all our previous online lectures since last February. So about our speaker this evening, Mr. Tony Hennessy. Tony is a professional genealogist and member of Accredited Genealogist Ireland, and he has been involved in the world of genealogy since 1985. He undertakes personalised genealogical research for both native Irish and members of the Irish diaspora, and specialises in designing and drawing extensive and, may I say, beautiful family trees. Tony also lectures on genealogy courses at University College Cork, University of Limerick and Dublin City Colleges. In December 2019, Tony, in partnership with Pavi Point and members of the Irish travelling community, compiled several large traveller family trees, which were formally presented at their request to the National Library of Ireland to hold in trust for everyone. As regards what Tony's talk will cover tonight, he will show you how to identify several different types of family tree, learn how to draw one, decide what information to include in one, explore the use of fam photographs in family trees, discuss computer-based family tree packages, and best of all, enjoy a short film. I've no doubt that you'll enjoy Tony's lively presentation, and I'm delighted now to hand over to him to discuss how to create your family tree. Over to you, Tony. Thank you. Thank you kindly, Elizabeth. I do appreciate that. Hello there, folks. I hope you're all well out there. Um, I hope you can see me. Uh, I can't see you. I'm sure you're all out there, um, unless uh, Elizabeth is playing a, a prank on me. Um, I'm reminded of uh, Phil Linnett of uh, Tin Lizzy fame, who used to shout out from the stage out into the darkened auditorium, are you out there? And I do hope uh, that you are out there uh, too and listening in. And uh, there's a lot on offer on uh, Culture Night. And thank you kindly uh, for deciding that this is the one for you uh, at this time of the evening. Um, uh, thanks likewise, uh, as Elizabeth said, to those of the diaspora who are out there. We have the biggest diaspora of any country in the world uh, by a long shot. And uh, those of you um, in various corners of the world and us Irish are indeed uh, to be found just about anywhere. Um, you're all very, very welcome uh, tonight. And uh, thanks for, um, for keeping the light of your Irish heritage alive. Uh, if you're here, that's certainly what you're doing. Um, so my talk, um, I think uh, Elizabeth has a big red button there. And if I run uh, over, uh, she might press it and I could disappear down through the floor here. Um, and uh, I don't want that to happen. So I'm going to um, charge ahead and call up uh, my PowerPoint presentation, if I can. Um, let me see. Perfect. 
Is that okay, Elizabeth? Absolutely. Okay, I have this window here, which I need to, yeah, okay. Very good. Um, so I hope you all see that uh, nice and clearly, uh, how to draw uh, a family tree. And I'll push on. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, three questions. And the first question is, have you been researching your family history uh, for years and years? The second question, are the results of your life's work to be found in shoe boxes on a shelf under the bed and in a wide assortment of files? And thirdly, are you the only person in the world who can make any sense of it all? And uh, I would imagine there is a few of you uh, nodding your heads there. Um, but if the answer to all of that uh, is a resounding yes, well then it is time for you to draw a family tree. And when you draw a family tree, uh, three good things will happen to you. It's a little bit like those uh, uh, chain mail things. Uh, if you don't, if you don't uh, send it on, uh, you get bad luck. If you, if you uh, send it on, you get good luck. And three good things will happen to you if you do your family tree. And I'll tell you what they are. You will immediately feel a wonderful sense of relief as your work has been saved forever in an easily accessible form. And I vouch for that myself. Uh, you can hang your new chart on the wall, which will bring you contentment and joy. Who doesn't want that? And you can share your family tree with your extended family who will be delighted and who will remember you with great fondness and appreciation for generations to come. So what's not to love about all of that? And for those of you who haven't been doing your research, uh, and are new to it. Um, I, I do believe that um, what you're going to hear tonight is um, will hopefully send you uh, on the road um, as well. So in this talk, we will uh, do the things that Elizabeth just said I was going to do, and I hope I do do them all. Um, we compare some uh, computer-based family tree packages uh, briefly. We'll identify three types of family trees. We we'll learn how to draw a family tree. We will discuss uh, what information to include in a family tree, and we'll explore the use of photographs in family in a family tree. And if there's time left, and Elizabeth doesn't uh, press that big red button, we hopefully will enjoy a very short film together. So straight away, I go to uh, the top three computer-based family tree packages. And for those who don't know. Um, these software packages, um, they don't do the research for you, uh, but they allow you to uh, input uh, your own research uh, that you uh, and the information you are gathering, uh, whether that be names, dates, place names, photographs, etc. And you put them into the software package and um, eventually you have a critical mass of information that will uh, you can then manipulate within the software package. and. Um, and uh, do family trees, draw family trees, um, or uh, reports, or uh, family group sheets, or that type of thing. Um, and so looking at that, Family Tree Maker is actually the number one and has been for many, many years. It's the oldest of them all. Um, it started, uh, the first Family Tree Maker came out, I believe, in 1989, which is not very long after, um, uh, the internet uh, met with the world of genealogy and between the two of them, they became uh, the most successful marriage of all time and uh, continues to be uh, a marriage uh, that is flourishing. And, um, and Family Tree Maker uh, is a child of that marriage, I guess. And uh, so it has um, uh, a big support network uh, because people have been using it uh, for so long but they have a great range of tree uh, templates and report templates. Um, uh, and another thing that it does of late is it accommodates uh, same-sex unions. And I believe it may well be the, the only one that does that, uh, certainly the only um, ones of the, of the big hitters. And um, it is uh, certainly time uh, that someone uh, did that. Uh, where, we're in the 21st year of the 21st century, and um, it was time for uh, those uh, 
computer programs to to catch up with the real life. And um, I would imagine that the other family tree makers, those two underneath it there, uh, have not done that yet. Um, but I would imagine that it makes a difference uh, and, and they will catch up. Um, family tree maker also has a thing called FTM Connect, which is an app for your phone, which allows you to bring all the, the information you have on your family tree maker uh, in your phone and carry it around, which is helpful if you go to the library or the archives or the GRO or somewhere like that. Uh, but I have a little asterisk there which says, uh, let's be careful out there. And I, I'm saying that because, um, uh, as some of us might know, uh, genealogy starts out as uh, an interest and then it becomes uh, a fascination and then it subsequently becomes an obsession. And some of us might be obsessed and um, you find yourself speaking uh, to people who maybe do not know or have as much interest as you do uh, in the world of genealogy. And now all of a sudden you have all this information at your fingertips. And, um, and I, uh, some years ago, came up with the word uh, a genealogist. And there's a lot of genealogists uh, out there. And uh, so we have to be able to identify them. And some of them uh, proactively do not like genealogy and do not like you um, uh, doorstepping them and um, uh, at, at the, the party and um, pulling out the family tree as it were. Uh, so let's be careful out there on that one. Uh, we have to be all socially aware. Um, so uh, Family Tree Builder by MyHeritage uh, uh, comes in second. Uh, they, they start for free, so you can download it for free. Uh, but then when you arrive at 150 names, um, it becomes, uh, you have to pay for uh, further access to it. So then you're moving uh, at 150 names, you're certainly moving from interested into fascinated. And so they catch you just at the right time um, and you have to cough up. Um, Legacy 9, uh, they tell me that they have the best range of chart templates. And you have chart templates such as big circular charts or uh, bow tie type uh, charts and all sorts of um, ones of that nature um, and different styles. Um, but they have that. But one thing about Legacy, it's designed for Windows. It's not designed for, um, for the Mac. And uh, you need to keep that in mind if that's your world. Um, they all come out at about the same price, 70 euros or there or thereabouts, I would think. Um, so I, I leave it at that at the moment. I would recommend that, so, that if someone is starting out, that they do get it. Um, I, I suppose I have to put my hand up and say, um, I used to use Family Tree Maker. Um, I haven't used it in, in a long time. I used to draw my family trees uh, with it, uh, but now um, I actually draw, and I, I'm saying this because usually I'll be asked it somewhere along the way. Um, I draw my family trees using a, an architectural um, a package, drawing package called Vectorworks, which gives me more freedom than I had uh, with a family tree maker when it comes to drawing a bespoke family trees. But I will say that I'm always looking over my shoulder and I'm sure eventually uh, all these um, ancestry and find my past will have a facility uh, where someone presses a big red button and the perfect family tree pops out uh, of the printer. And um, uh, so I have to try and keep ahead of the posse at all times. Uh, so we're gonna talk about uh, three uh, popular types of family tree. And here's a lovely photograph of my own little family tree, a three generation uh, family tree, uh, my father, my son, and, uh, and myself. And when my son Oshin, was born, uh, he, we were given a present of a, an oak tree, which has grown uh, for the last 26 years. I'd like to point out to Washington on occasion uh, that in this photograph, I have brown hair and this is only when, when he arrived, um, uh, the, the hair color changed. So uh, the discussion is still open as to whether it's uh, nature or nurture has changed my hair color, uh, but there you go. Uh, so we have three types of um, family tree. Uh, that we look at, a descendant tree, an ancestor tree, and an hourglass tree. And uh, they are um, very popular types. And so I look at, firstly, uh, the descendant tree. Here I have a very basic three-generation tree. And with the descendant tree, um, 
you're you're looking at one branch of the family only. And in this case, uh, the primary couple is at the top. Um, so it might be if if uh, if you can get back as far as your great great grandfather, uh, well then um, it could be your great great grandfather and grandparents and their children and their grandchildren and all the way down. But it doesn't go through the other great great grandparents. So it's one side only. Um, and just to walk you through this a little bit, uh, because what we're what we um, what's very important is the line work. And I can't emphasize that too much. Uh, the line work has to be uh, correct. And if you get the line work correct, uh, it doesn't matter how big or small you wish your family tree to be. Um, it should be still uh, readable and correct once the line work is done. Uh, I've done, I think my biggest one to date is 18 generations and uh, the line work is just uh, the same right through. So in this case, we have Maliki Whelan and we have Catherine Murphy and a little equal sign uh, there between the two of them. And that uh, represents a, a marriage. Um, sometimes if it's, um, if it's a partnership rather than a marriage, uh, I leave one of the little equal signs out. And dare I say, if it's a, if it's a gay marriage, um, I don't do anything. I just leave the equal sign because they're married and it doesn't make a difference. Um, so uh, there's a line that comes out um, uh, from the bottom of uh, the equal sign um, and descends down to the horizontal line. So that line doesn't come down from underneath Malachi or underneath Catherine. It comes down from the bottom of the equal sign. And so in this case, I'm showing three children. We have Michael Whelan, Kitty Whelan and Malachi Whelan. And the little lines come down into the middle of their names. And Michael Whelan is married to Agnes North. And needless to say, um, Agnes North doesn't have a little line coming up there because she is not a child of the above marriage. And uh, onwards we go then uh, down from, uh, from Michael uh, to his children. And we have four children here, uh, Louis, Sean, Catherine Whelan and Frank Whelan. And uh, Catherine is married to Daniel Kelly. And I, I usually put the, uh, or, or, I always do, uh, put the, the men at the left-hand side and the women at the right-hand side um, in the marriages. And I hope that's the way you're seeing it there. I'm not, not uh, in a mirror uh, situation from you. Um, so that's uh, the line work there. And, and it can continue down through. And if you're on top of that, well, then um, everything should be in its rightful place. And if you're not on top of it, you may inadvertently um, marry off uh, your auntie Joan uh, to her own brother or her, or her uncle uh, by mistake. And you certainly don't want to do that. Um, here's a family tree, a small one I did uh, for the back of a, a report. And it's um, William Function. It's an unusual name, Function, uh, but you find them uh, in Kilkenny. And uh, William's son, Pierce Function, married Johanna Thompson in 1881 in Kilmagany. And they had several children, and we'll just count them here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So they had 14 children, and I could have put them all in a row, and I'd be shooting out the window here to the right of me. And um, so I just uh, stepped it up and down like that. But because I'm using the correct uh, line work, it's very obvious to everybody what's going on there. And they're all children of Pierce and Johanna. And uh, Margaret then subsequently uh, went on to marry James there, and they had a further nine children. So I'm just going to take a stab in the dark here and, uh, and uh, have a guess that this is a, a good Irish Catholic uh, family. Um, sure it is. Um, so then we come on to the ancestor tree and the ancestor tree um, <clears throat> starts at the bottom. And in this case, for this little example, I put myself here at the bottom. And so it comes up uh, with my father, my mother, my father's father, my father's mother, my mother's father, my mother's mother, and on it goes. So what you have, in fact, are all your direct ancestors are in the ancestor tree. And um, what you don't have in an ancestor tree is you don't have your father's brother. 
or your mother's sister or your, your grandfather's brother. They're all directly related. So your, your DNA comes down actually through uh, directly through these. And, and we, again, we look at the line work here. Um, the line comes up. There's a few different ways of doing an ancestor tree, but this is very much the most common one. Uh, the line comes up to the underside of the name and out the top of it in a, and onwards. And, um, and that's the way it goes. And have I a, a little example? There's a, an example of a, uh, just a little bit more advanced. Uh, my darling mother there uh, at the bottom, Breda O'Connor. And so on the left hand side, we have her, uh, her father, then his father, then his father, uh, all of them, uh, James O'Connor. Um, my grandfather, great grandfather, and great great grandfather. Which uh, thanks very much, lads. Um, uh, no, uh, uh, no complications there. Um, and then on the right hand side, you end up with your mother's 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 side, uh, and of course all the, the surnames changing there along the way. Um, I added a little bit of color to the um, generations just to bring a bit of visual clarity. Uh, and that can be important at times. So that's a, a, a pure ancestor tree. You could, of course, do um, what I call a, an ancestor plus tree, which is um, all the direct ancestors and their brothers and sisters. And it becomes obviously a much bigger family tree, uh, but it's certainly um, a doable one. And you're getting, uh, so you're getting everyone in there, uh, most people anyway. But this is a, a purely an ancestor tree. The only people that you can actually uh, authentically put into an ancestor tree would be brothers or sisters of the primary person. So in this case, it could well be uh, I put my mother's brothers and sisters in there. And um, obviously, the direct ancestors would be their direct ancestors as well. And so thirdly, we come on to an hourglass tree. And this shows three generations of a family. And in this case, the primary person is in the middle. And an hourglass tree, quite simply, is um, an ancestor tree sitting on top of a descendant tree. And uh, this I find um, I, I, I usually, uh, it's probably the most common uh, family tree that I do. And uh, if you think of something like um, uh, granny and granddad's uh, 40th wedding anniversary or 50th wedding golden jubilee whatever it might be um, you have the the primary couple in the middle and so you have granny and granddad in the middle and then uh, their respective parents and grandparents uh, up over them and and then their children and grandchildren and possibly uh, two or three great grandchildren uh, underneath that uh, for me um, I draw family trees uh, all the time uh, that, that would be uh, one that's very commonly uh, requested. In this case, again, looking at the, at the line work, in this case, um, this is uh, the primary person here is Daniel Kelly, um, my father-in-law, and uh, it shows his, um, his father and his mother. And then he's married to Harini Whelan, who, by an amazing coincidence, is actually my wife's mother. And... Um, they have uh, three children, uh, very beautiful uh, Caroline Kelly and her two almost as beautiful uh, sisters, Sue and Jilly. Um, but uh, that template can be used uh, for a, a big family tree. Uh, but that's so that's what a, an hourglass family tree looks like. So what should I include on my family tree? Uh, well, I would say make it as informative as possible. And um, you need to get the facts down. And uh, but you need to do more than uh, get the facts down. Um, uh, or when I say the facts, you, you have the, the births, deaths and marriages and the places of birth, etc. And um, you need to get all of that in. So you need to try and move beyond um, a series of names and dates uh, and names and dates. Um, are like a bag of bones, if you like. And what we want to do is to put a bit of flesh on the bones and a bit of color in the cheeks uh, of our ancestors. And, um, and we want to make a fascinating 
uh, document. Um, the, in real life, uh, we're trying to find uh, the human being uh, behind the name. And uh, so in real life, people have different characters and different personalities. And we try to, as much as we can, try and reflect that um, in the family tree. And so um, we put down things like uh, occupations, or um, we find information in the 1901-1911 censuses, uh, such as um, the type of house that they lived in. Um, and I say here, actually, um, and my hat is always off to the National Archives of Ireland, um, who, who uh, have the, uh, the 1901 and 1911 census um, uh, carefully, carefully stored away, but they, they have it freely available online uh, to the world uh, for the last number of years, and it's been the most successful thing ever. I do uh, remember back to the days uh, when you had to visit the National Archives uh, and go digging out the boxes, uh, but um, those days are long gone and uh, our censuses are up online and for free. And um, uh, we sometimes uh, don't think too much about that, but uh, in actual fact, the, the English um, and Scottish and American um, uh, censuses uh, are invariably behind a paywall, uh, but a decision was made back in, 19, uh, in 2010 or thereabouts um, to put our ones up for free. Uh, by the National Archives. And I salute you, and I salute you every day when I use uh, uh, and go in there and, um, uh, and go searching and using the, uh, the 1901 or 1911 census. It's a joy to use that website. And I urge everyone who hasn't done so to get in there and have a good route around and uh, see what you can find out. Um, I have here, uh, did your ancestors keep pigs or hens? Well, form B2, which is up there, um, for both censuses, uh, that tells us uh, what outhouses uh, were attached to the family farm or to the family home, and it could have been that there was a pigsty, or that there was a fowl house there, or that there was a stable or a cowshed, and these um, extend our knowledge of our ancestors and give us um, a more acute uh, appreciation of of their lives. Um, I'm saying there maybe they owned a pack of foxhounds. Uh, they mightn't find that on the census. Um, but uh, invariably, if they had a pack of foxhounds, you might find that information uh, somewhere else. Uh, but um, so these kind of things um, paint the picture. How much land did the family have? Uh, we can find that in Griffith's valuation from the middle 1800s. So they may have had uh, three acres, uh, two roods and uh, 22 purchase of land, maybe. Um, or they may have had uh, 72 acres of land and we they're all uh, the word farmer uh, is a bit of a catch-all but there's a hell of a difference between the small farmer and the strong farmer as they say and uh, we we should be able to put that information there uh, what acreage of land they had and uh, it again um, informs uh, our our image of uh, the ancestor um, other information that we could include too are uh, were there sportsmen or women? Um, were they winning medals for one thing or another? Uh, maybe they were in the old IRA or common Amman or uh, the Free State Army. Uh, maybe they were British Army. So many of the Irish were. Um, uh, and we can follow their army record and, and uh, include a, a maybe part of their story uh, while in the army. Uh, maybe they were musicians or dancers. And that kind of information, um, again, does a lot to put the color in the cheeks of one's ancestor. Here's a couple of excerpts from some family trees. Uh, the man there on the left-hand side is my own grandfather. Um, I, I have a, a, a quarter of my DNA comes from him. And uh, as you can see, um, that DNA included um, his uh, beautiful blonde hair, and uh, some might call it white or gray. Uh, but uh, um, I'm slowly but surely uh, turning into uh, him, uh, I'm being told. Um, but uh, I'm happy to do so. He was a very nice man. Uh, so simple things like um, where, when you were born, where you were born, when you were married, where you were married, when they died, where they died, and where they are buried, and uh, occupations. Um, uh, they're B2 
basic enough things. And then you can extend that. The lady on the right hand side here is one I'm working on at the moment. And uh, she emigrated to America with her family uh, from Tipperary uh, when she was 16. And the mother and father and um, eight children uh, emigrated. And as I said there, um, on the 11th of April, 1890, they sailed uh, on the SS Catalonia, arriving in Charleston, Massachusetts, 12 days later, and they settled in Cumberland, Providence, Rhode Island. And she worked uh, at a cotton mill as a cotton weaver and a cotton spooler. And she was later an assistant cook at Lincoln's Lunch, a little uh, diner. And uh, she married and then uh, lived various places, and I have them all at there and then she eventually died in in 1965 age 91 at a nursing home in Cent central falls in providence um and she's buried at mount calvary cemetery in cumberland so there's a lot of information on something like that and as you can see uh, the photographs uh, also add to it i have to say johanna's uh, story um family story is incredible in that the five uh, the whole family as i say eight children and their parents all uh, moved from Tipperary, they were farming people, uh, and moved to the New World looking for um, a, a more prosperous life, I would imagine. And uh, most unfortunately, um, uh, they all died out. Um, uh, Johanna was the last of them by a long shot, and uh, there were two marriages of two of the children, and uh, there was just one child uh, from all eight children, um, of the next generation and uh, was a, a child of Johannes. And uh, he married, uh, but he never had children himself. And so uh, of the whole family, uh, they are now uh, have died out in, um, in uh, Rhode Island, uh, virtually within one generation, which is incredible. Um, I did a family tree for uh, the Beatty family um, who once upon a time lived uh, in Fitzwilliam Square. Um, in uh, in Dublin, and um, I suppose the main the, the most famous person on the family tree is Admiral David Beatty, who was the first Earl Beatty. And so I have some information there. Uh, he fought um, in the First World War in the Battle of Jutland, and made his name there as an admiral. And he became admiral of the fleet after the First World War, and a bit of a hero. And uh, was created first Earl Beatty. Viscount Borrowdale of Wexford and Baron Beatty of the North Sea and of Brooksby. So quite a mouthful there. And uh, he, he was held in the highest of regard and was uh, buried in St. Paul's Cathedral um, when he died uh, and had a state funeral. Um, but another little thing which I, uh, I liked and uh, put in on the family tree um, is that uh, Admiral Beatty wore his hat at a jaunty angle. Uh, which became known as the Beatty Tilt. And he also had his uniform jackets tailored for six buttons instead of the regulation eight. Not very uh, academic, academic information, but it certainly um, puts a bit of color in his cheeks. And despite the fact he was Admiral of the Fleet, sounds like he was a bit of a uh, anti-establishment uh, within himself uh, as well. Maybe it's the, the Irish man in him. But, um, uh, yeah, by all accounts, um, the BT tilt became uh, something that everyone started doing uh, back in the day uh, at that time. Uh, and then the, the little chap here beside him, um, it's a young photo, of, but, but he lived, uh, he was 34 when he died, Henry Longfield Beatty. He's a half brother uh, to Admiral Beatty. He was 30 years younger. Um, but he had a tragic uh, situation where uh, in 1935 he was flying. Um, a flying boat um, uh, and it crashed into the side of a mountain uh, near Sicily and all eight of the crew um, were killed. And, um, and then, sorry, and then uh, as I read here, a few days later after uh, the tragedy, in a bizarre and tragic twist, two sisters who had become acquainted with the pilot and co-pilot in Naples within the previous fortnight, they jumped to their, their deaths from a, an aeroplane in a double suicide. So um, quite tragic, um, quite tragic, but utterly fascinating uh, at the same time. And um, so I included it on uh, the family tree. Um, but uh, very striking. Uh, 
Um, yeah, there you go. Uh, so, uh, um, yeah, just to say that uh, all that kind of information, don't be afraid to put it on your family tree. Um, it, it makes for a, a fascinating document and, um, uh, and no harm. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, photographs uh, for your family tree. Uh, here we have a, a lovely big photograph of um, my granduncle Mikey, big Mikey Hennessy. Uh, he was married in 1940. And uh, so we have a formal portrait. And, um, and then uh, if you scan that to a high resolution, you can crop all these little photographs out of it and uh, use all these individual photographs uh, in the family tree. Um, here's one I prepared earlier, as they say. Um, I did this for my darling mother for her 80th birthday um, uh, a few years ago. And it's um, her own people, as they say, the, the powers of Whelan's Bridge, Kilmeade and Mortford. And um, uh, the first thing that uh, one notices, and she certainly did, I didn't pay too much attention to it, um, but it was remarked uh, by herself and her brothers, was that um, we have uh, 12 brothers and sisters here, and I got photographs for all but one of them, and uh, put them all together here. But with a, a big family, um, a lot of you may well know that some of them are gone before the young ones come along, and to have them all in the same place at the same time uh, is virtually impossible, um, uh, certainly back in the day when immigration was a big thing. And this family was no different. And, uh, but when I gathered all the photographs and put them all together, symbolically at least, it actually brought the family uh, back together again. And that was something that uh, was um, uh, very much appreciated uh, by the children of, um, of uh, these, uh, all my granduncles and grandaunts, and um, certainly was uh, remarked upon. Uh, but as you can see, um, a, a photograph, uh, it can bring people into a family tree. Uh, uh, people I would imagine, uh, like ourselves here, yourselves at the talk here tonight, you have an interest in family history. Uh, so you would probably have a look at um, a family tree that doesn't have um, photographs in it. Whereas uh, some of those other people, uh, the genealogists, um, they, they may show an interest when they see the photographs. And it's like a bunch of keys, if you like, um, where they, uh, they open the doors to the understanding of this. And all of a sudden, they're kind of going, well, that man there, he was my grandfather's brother. I didn't realize that. And that's where he came in. And they're his children there. Oh, that's how that's all connected. And you have this um, understanding and the photographs. Um, uh, bring us into that and make it easier um, for many of us uh, to understand the family history. Um, and there's some beautiful old photographs all around the edge there. And, um, and some of those family tree uh, templates uh, that are available should be able to allow that to happen these days. Here's a family tree I did for uh, Marty Welch, uh, the mayor of Boston. Uh, he became mayor of Boston in 2014, but he's now um, he's now the um, the Labour secretary uh, under Joe Biden just of late. And um, but his story is is quite fascinating. He was born in Boston, uh, but his father and mother, um, both of them were born and reared in uh, the depths of the Connemara Gaeltacht, and both of them uh, very much native Irish speakers. And uh, they lived about 15 miles apart from each other, but never met until they uh, bumped into each other in a dance hall in Boston and, uh, and married. And um, so when, uh, when Marty came along, um, he was reared uh, through Irish as his first language in Boston. And uh, he, is, he is very much a fluent Irish speaker, um, I understand. And um, his father uh, was very much a, a working uh, a working navvy uh, and worked hard all his life. Um, but uh, John Welch, uh, his father's name, but uh, locally uh, within his own people in, in Connemara, he would have been known as uh, John Vorteen Tom, uh, which is John, the son of Martin, the son of Tom. So his name is actually like a little family tree in itself. Um, and likewise, um, Marty's mother 
uh, Mary O'Malley, who is uh, still hail and hearty in America. And um, uh, I'm not sure if she, uh, her O'Malley is related to Grace O'Malley, uh, the pirate queen, Grania Whale, as she's called. Um, but uh, her name, uh, she would be known locally uh, in the Grail Talk as uh, Mary Jo Fadder. And again, uh, Mary, the daughter of Jo uh, O'Malley, who was the son of Padder O'Malley or Peter O'Malley. And uh, so I put that information in there uh, on the family tree. Another little thing I did on the family tree in this particular one, um, uh, John Welch came from uh, the parish of Karna, which faces out there onto uh, Galway Bay. And there's a little island just off the parish. Uh, they're called St. Mac Macdara's Island. And in the sixth century, St. Macdara founded a little monastery there and is buried there still. And uh, he, uh, there's a, a beautiful uh, ancient little church. Uh, you see it in the photograph there, uh, standing there on the little island, which is un uninhabited. And tradition has it that when the sailors and, and fishermen pass by, out of respect, they dip their sails um, as they pass by. And uh, I found a little poem to that effect and just put a few words from the poem on it. And the poem uh, says, the boatman on his daily quest upon the endless boundless sea, when passing St. Macdara's rest, there dips his brown barked sail to be. And so I know that that would uh, mean something uh, and mean a lot maybe to, uh, uh, to Marty Walsh and his family. Uh, I do a lot of, uh, as Elizabeth alluded to, I do um, work, uh, genealogy work with a traveling community and I'm uh, proud and honored to be doing so. And um, uh, here's a, a family tree uh, that I did uh, for, with a, a group down here in Waterford. And um, it turned out well, I think. Uh, some beautiful photographs uh, were gathered. Uh, there's a lovely studio photograph there of Maggie and Hanny O'Reilly, as you can see. Um, but um, one thing that uh, we can put in on a family tree, and you can find a home on a family tree uh, for uh, the children uh, who died in infancy. And you certainly don't have to be uh, a traveler to have a child uh, dying in infancy. Uh, we all um, have that story uh, within our own families, or the vast majority of us do, uh, certainly. And um, not only our own generation, but uh, more so the generation that went before or, or the generations that went before. And so many, uh, very often, those children um, are quietly remembered, um, but rarely spoken about. Um, and so I like to uh, see, can I um, uh, find uh, the birth records of uh, those children that died in infancy? And uh, and then uh, the death records, and they will give a date of birth and a place of birth, and the date of death and a place of death, and they will also uh, then tell you um, that the child may have lived a couple of days, or a couple of weeks, or maybe uh, they'd be three and a half, or uh, however old, but it is a nice thing to put them on there. Uh, they are actually part of the family story, and the family story is incomplete uh, without their little story. And um, so um, a family tree is one place where they can be acknowledged and included uh, within the family. Uh, another thing um, uh, also is that, uh, and I'm looking at, the, at, at uh, traveler family trees, uh, there, there's an awful lot of uh, hardship and tragedy within them. And um, uh, the scourge of uh, suicide is um, within the traveling community is uh, something like six times more uh, than the settled community, which is an incredible uh, uh, statistic. Um, and we find uh, that some people, um, th that the pain that that brings, uh, uh, a person becomes uh, silent and, and uh, unable to, to speak the name, as it were. And um, whereas a family tree can represent that family and um, put that uh, person in there and maybe the photograph and, um, and acknowledge them. And so a family tree moves beyond being just um, uh, a record of, some, of the family story, births, deaths and marriages, as it were, 
um, it becomes um, a document of remembrance. And there's a healing in that, and there's a power in that. And, um, and for someone to have a family tree like that, maybe hanging on the wall and passing it every day, um, it, it, it helps, it helps. And um, so it's, a, it's an aspect of genealogy that I bump into from time to time. And, um, it, um, and I, I do what I can in there. Um, I, was, I was asked to do a, a family tree for uh, Bernie Sanders and his wife there a few years ago, and I was happy to do so. And um, they were here in, in Ireland and I met them in Dublin, and uh, I was honoured to do so. Um, um, Bernie Sanders, uh, obviously he doesn't have many Irish roots himself. Uh, his father was a, a Polish Jew uh, from the town of Slopnice in Poland, and he travelled uh, uh, from Poland uh, through Belgium uh, to uh, America uh, in 1921. Uh, just as a 16 year old and he traveled alone and uh, he followed his brother uh, to America, uh, but they left um, another brother, a uh, half brother, uh, uh, Rummick, uh, behind uh, in Slotnice and he lived there uh, and uh, when, the, when the Nazis arrived, as they certainly did, um, they, in 1941 they rounded up all the young men and older men uh, of the town into the village, into the town square, and they they shot and killed uh, four hundred of them. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Rummick uh, was among those. And in actual fact, Rummick's uh, eleven-year-old daughter, uh, Helena, uh, she suffered uh, the same fate at the hands of uh, the Nazis. And that information I put in the family tree, and uh, Bernie uh, was very uh, thankful for having put it in there, I have to say. Uh, I won't say that he has a huge interest in family history himself. Um, he, he's 100% uh, focused on the future, I would think, rather than the past, but um, uh, he, he very much enjoyed uh, what he saw and he brought away the family tree. His wife, uh, Jane O'Mara, um, she is very much interested in her family history and has been uh, for uh, 40 years and more. Um, my uh, good friend and colleague, uh, John Grenham, uh, did some research and discovered the Irish roots of her great grandmother, uh, Mary Lee. And Mary Lee was born in 19, 1841, down in the townland of Craymore in Yall, uh, in Yall by the sea, as they say, uh, down in County Cork. And um, uh, Mary Lee uh, was the daughter of Michael Lee and Johanna Murphy. And Michael Lee was a uh, very much a strong farmer at the time. Uh, he had uh, over 70 acres of land and good quality land at that. And um, but they left during the famine times. Uh, they were gone before the Griffiths valuation uh, was published in 1851, I think it is for that area. Um, but I did find them, or we did find them in the in the house books, the valuation office house books. So just at the turn. Uh, there they were, and there they were gone. Um, but um, so uh, I discovered, um, uh, I met the lady who lives in the, uh, on and farms the same 70 acres, and the house uh, that Mary Lee was born into in 1841 was still standing up to uh, 1981, and the lady who owns it um, was, and, and who I met was actually born in the house and she subsequently uh, knocked it down and built a bungalow beside it, as so many did. And um, but uh, I went down there the, the day before I met Jane and I, I discovered that the old farmyard is still there and um, the gable end of the original house is still standing. And I took away four stones, uh, small stones. I didn't want the, the gable end to fall down. And um, uh, at the end of our little chat, I took out the four stones and I gave them uh, to uh, to Jane and it kind of knocked her head off, I'd be very honest. And tears were shed uh, by more than one person. And uh, but it was a nice uh, finish to it. And uh, on my family trees, I uh, invariably I put uh, this uh, verse from a poem by uh, the Irish 
poet and philosopher, uh, John O'Donoghue. And he wrote a poem called Banach, Banacht, which is the Irish for a blessing. And uh, so this is the verse that I usually put on my family trees and I, and I send it out to you all here. Um, May the nourishment of the earth be yours. May the clarity of light be yours. May the fluency of the ocean be yours. May the protection of the ancestors be yours. And now I'm going to uh, try and move uh, and show you this little film. And the little film is called How to Draw a Family Tree Without Using Up Four Rolls of Wallpaper. And I'm speaking as someone who has been given uh, uh, big rolls of a family tree uh, to try and make sense of. And um, if the pattern was different, I could have wallpapered the hall stairs and landing with the size of the rolls and um, hard to make sense of them. Um, so my little film is to try and show you how not to uh, do that. So I think I'm going to have to uh, shut down this and um, let me see. Oh, one second. Mm Excuse me, folks, I'm not quite there yet. I'm a little bit stuck here. Not quite sure if you can. Hi, Tony. Yeah, we, we see your, your large screen, Tony. Yes. If you can click then how to draw family tree, the fourth, the fourth yes. is lighting in from the right hand side there. If you double click on that, that should work. Yeah. It's just. Um, I'm, my meeting controls have been minimized and I just can't get to them, which is a bit of a puzzle to me. Oh, wait, no, sorry. Um, That's okay, take your time. Um, yes, so I want to uh, share my screen and let me just try this. Yep, it's working, perfect. You can see that? Yep. Very good. So I walk you through that. Um, so these are my great great grandparents. I'm looking at a, a different screen here. James O'Connor having a little chat there. What's happening? I'm just finished reading this book, which is incredible. Because the 1901 census said I can't read or write. There's a little genealogy joke there, folks. So they had a, a son, James, and then James um, had a big bunch of children himself. Here they all come and all their, um, their other halves. I think there's eight children uh, and all of them got married and they all had lots of children. So bring on the kids. Oh, wait, here's the photographs of them. Music harks back to the old make and do. This is obviously a simplified version. So here are all the children. Lots and lots of children. We 
we have too many grandchildren. So I gather up all the family units, put each family unit on a little. We'll have seven, seven there, seven family units. And now it's about getting the line work correct, be able to connect each branch of the family to their respective uh, parents. So I'll have a little bit of that, fancy fancy. Then here I am with my line work. Here are the children. And I have the children organized down below so that, uh, so the layers of, of the, the next generation, you can see it in three layers going across. And if we position the three layers correctly, we will be able to bring down a diagonal or a, a, um, a vertical line down from uh, the from the parents to the children, and then all of a sudden it becomes uh, clear. I would hope it becomes clear. Well done, well done. I think we're great. It happens. We're great, great. My great, great grandparents. Are we great, great, great yet? That's great. I hope you thought it was a little bit great. Thank you very much, Tony. You're most welcome. Thank you That's, kindly. Um, not at all. Glad, glad we got the, the video there. Yes. Um, Tony, when you're ready, could I ask you maybe to yeah. stop sharing there whenever the film is, is over? Okay. How's that? Please. Thank thank you. Thank you very much. Very um good. well Tony, first off, obviously, thank you very, very much for that fascinating presentation on creating your family tree. So we've had a, a, a busy QA box here. Okay, very so, good. Um I thought we would get started on a couple of the questions. Yes, indeed. Um, there is a lady, Brenda, here. Hello, Brenda. Who is saying about, uh, is talking about Ancestry.com. And she says, I know it's a way of searching, but does it make trees as well? Um, yes, it does. And um, Ancestry, um, uh, once again, our, our, the great grandfather of all uh, um, genealogy websites, and has been around a, a long, long time. Um, and one of the things that it does is that uh, we can we can draw our family tree uh, using some of those programs uh, that we were looking at. And you can draw them um, on your own computer and keep them private. Um, or else you can press the button that Ancestry keeps pushing you to push and, um, and make uh, bring the family tree up uh, live on their website. And lots of people do that and share their family trees. And um, uh, there are many millions, I think, at this stage uh, of private individuals, family trees online. And you can go in there and uh, uh, have a look. And if your stuff overlaps theirs, they will, they will flag that to you. And in some instances, some people have um, very, very detailed family trees and include all the, the supporting documentation, which is very important to look at. Uh, but they also may well have uh, some beautiful old photographs. And um, usually if I'm doing a family tree for someone, I will go in there and have a look and see uh, is their second cousin once removed, maybe doing the same family tree and there's an overlap and they have photographs. Uh, and uh, from time to time, I do find those. So uh, the answer is yes, they do have family trees up online. And you can keep, as I say, you can keep it private or you can make it public. Uh, but one caveat is that um, do not believe that everything you see is um, 
is uh, is accurate and true. And I'll give you a very brief story where if, um, I was asked to do uh, a family uh, to do some research for a lady, and she was looking uh, for a woman uh, called uh, uh, Anne Cullerton, I think was her name, uh, off the top of my head. And um, she told me lots about her, but I couldn't find one blessed thing about her. Uh, but what I did find was that uh, the lady, uh, my client, had a family tree up online. And so I saw this Anne Cullerton in her family tree with a little asterisk beside it, uh, which said, uh, this name was given to me by a psychic. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to uh, prove uh, that the psychic is correct. So I had lost uh, three days looking for a uh, a person who's a, um, a part of a, uh, one's imaginary uh, um, in their head uh, didn't happen in real life. Uh, so anyway, I should have written to the psychic and asked for uh, a few pounds for all the work I had done. So, <laughs> Funny, uh, actually, let the we, boy beware. We used, to, we used to get questions, I'm sure we still do queries in, in relation to our Rotunda Hospital maternity records. People will write in requesting the precise time of their birth because they need that for astrological charts. So, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, you will you will often get lots right. of different and sometimes weird and wonderful questions. The yeah. same lady, um, Tony, was wondering what the abbreviation SP means on a family tree. Um, I use SP for sponsor, uh, or the godparents. Um, okay. in the in the in the parish registers in Beverly, they're called sponsors. But um, uh, you can do a little legend over on the side which uh, tells you. Um, but sometimes what I do for some of the main uh, characters, the direct ancestors, I will um, put in uh, the full word born or the full word sponsors or the full word um, uh, married and, uh, and then do abbreviated versions so that people can see. Um, but yeah, sponsors, um, uh, sponsors to sponsors a baptism, to um, which show, which show the, a pattern of family names maybe. Oh, of course. And a, a lady here, Fiona, was asking, what program do you use in particular for building family trees? Um, Have you a, a particular favourite? I know you were yes. mentioning a few. Well, um, uh, I started out, um, I bought a version of uh, Family Tree Maker in 2009. And I inputted the information uh, I had at the time. And I started drawing uh, family trees. And uh, at the time I found them um, to be hard work. Um, I do remember that uh, the, the family tree was the whole time wanting to be wide, wide, wide. And I could eventually, I could pull it all in. But then if I made one tiny change, such as change the font size or something like this, and I could have 150 names, the minute I make that little change, it springs out again into this four meter long wide uh, thing. and. Uh, it became very frustrating. So uh, as it happens, I have a, um, a skill uh, in drawing, uh, drafting. Uh, and uh, so I use an architectural uh, drafting package. Um, okay. But I, I have, I do um, keep uh, my family history information on uh, fine, uh, Family Tree Maker, an old one, Family Tree Maker 2009. Uh, but I've never actually put my own family tree up online as such. Okay, well, uh, certainly you can uh, take a bow for brilliant presentation, marvellous graphics from uh, Patrick. Uh, he also is wondering, do you ever use photographs from the National Library Archive? I presume maybe the National Photographic Archive there, um, um, which comes under the, the umbrella. Yes, I do. Uh, down here in Waterford, uh, and I'm down here in the sunny southeast, um, gazing out at the sea here, um, uh, we are blessed. Uh, that the pool collection um, uh, is in the National Library of Ireland and, and the, the pool family here in Waterford uh, had a photo photographic business uh, which began in 1884 and went up to I think 1950 or 50 more, 51 or two and there's something like 65,000 photographs in that collection and a huge amount of them are uh, Waterford based uh, not mm. all of them by any means, and, and people should look, uh, but a lot of them are, are based in the southeast. Um, and uh, we have been blessed uh, to find uh, people there 
uh, in that. And and of late, actually, I found a lovely uh, wedding photograph uh, for somebody um, from 1890. Or the wedding was in 1900, and it was a, a beautiful photo that they hadn't seen before. And um, these were uh, people who uh, lived in America. And uh, uh, so I got a copy from, a very good copy from the National uh, Library. You can send off and get your copy for, uh, I think it's 20 euros. I get a, um, an electronic copy of it and it's of the highest quality. Uh, they, they, they do it specially uh, directly from the negatives. Actually, the same, Patrick. A uh, must of uh, in a uh, uh, must have some telepathy as well, because he says the poor the pool collection is brilliant for Tiffany and Waterford, which is just what you've you, yes, you've, you've said there. there is. There is a lady, Michelle, who's inquiring. Um, her mm -hmm. second great grandfather came to Ireland from Canada, in uh, from sorry from Ireland to Canada in eighteen forty seven. Yes. It wouldn't have been the other way around in 1847, God knows. Um, yes. Are there records of passengers from Ireland from back to that time? Uh, there are records, um, but the records themselves are minimal and it can be a frustration. Uh, from 1891, uh, in 1892, uh, Ellis Island uh, opened. And um, so uh, they have a wonderful... Um, application form um, and you, you, all the information that they gather when you're coming through um, and it, it includes uh, the address, the specific address that you left from um, and your, your nearest kin back in Ireland and likewise um, who are you going to and where are you going to um, and that very often is uh, to your brother John uh, in uh, Albany, upstate New York or something like that. Um, uh, but unfortunately, um, the before that period, there's very little detail on um, the uh, family uh, around the um, the manifests, the ships, passenger lists, um, and it depends um, on. Sometimes it depends on the surname uh, that you have. If it's a, a less common one, you might be able to pick them out, or if it's two people maybe traveling together. Um, and um, I think, um, yeah, I, I mean, Ancestry and Find My Past, they have uh, all those lists. And actually, um, uh, familysearch.org, uh, uh, which is a free website and a very good one, um, uh, they have a lot of those as well. So they're certainly worth looking for, but to be able to positively identify your own ancestor among all the other um, people of the same name is, is invariably the the, uh, the difficult bit. I've often found you're sometimes better off having a lawless or law-breaking ancestor when it comes to <laughs> Australia in particular, because when they were transported as convicts, they're short of actually counting the freckles on the faces of the people who arrived I do remember an Australian couple coming into the National Archives to the Reading Room and showing me the uh, ship's manifest and the details of their ancestor who had arrived and they were incredible yes. incredibly detailed the colour of their hair the colour of their eyes their name right. where they came in and I think you don't get that same wealth of information from the North American end no, of, 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 of things um, yeah, and certainly you're right there are not only Ellis Island but I do remember there was a Boston ship's passenger list a uh, website uh, as yes. well um, but I think what people sometimes do need to bear in mind when ancestors were leaving in the 1840s and 1850s that travel was voluntary to the extent that the British government wasn't monitoring who was leaving as they did with the um, with the convict records, of course. Of course. And for many people living, for example, in that 1847, not many people had a choice uh, leaving in yes, a year indeed. like that. Yeah. They were just get, getting out to, to save their lives in, right. in, in, many, in many cases. Um, there is a, a, an interesting question here. Um, would you have any suggestions on how to get personal information on people? Do you need to contact newspapers directly or is there an easy way to search their archives? What about searching court records? Information on people? Is that what you said? Just, yeah, generally the, the question is personal information on people. I, you know, obviously there's newspaper archives, but they're suggesting or asking whether court, or court records are, are something to, to look for as well or to look um, at. Yeah, I mean, um, 
it's it's a little bit uh, ironic that it's um, it's kind of more difficult to uh, find information um, about people that are uh, not long gone, or even some of them here. Uh, mm -hmm. It's easier to find information about uh, their their parents or grandparents uh, when it comes to online, because um, you know, for living people, you, you're not going to find uh, an awful lot of that information. And and uh, as an example, um, you know, there's an awful lot more information about soldiers from the First World War than there are from soldiers from the Second World War. And, mm -hmm. and in due course, I would imagine there might be uh, more available. But. Uh, um, uh, so the usual sources uh, for us genealogists uh, are the births, deaths, and marriages, and um, and that information is available online um, up as far as uh, let me see now um, um, births uh, from 1864 up to uh, 1920, uh, from marriages 1864 up to 1941, I think. 40, no, sorry, uh, 44, 45, 75 years uh, and more. And uh, and deaths, they come up as far as um, uh, 50 years. So that's what's um, uh, 1960, uh, up to 1970, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, uh, for records that are 100 years and more, 50 years or more and uh, 75 years or more. And uh, so those records are available to us. But you can go to the GRO in Dublin and actually uh, get marriages and births and deaths that are uh, more recent. Um, but you have to actually do it in person. It's not available to us online. Um, and we have baptisms, uh, but most of those, um, <clears throat> those records um, are uh, pre-1900. Or some of them come up to in recent times. My own uh, <coughs> late father's uh, baptismal record of 1933 happens to be uh, online there um, on Roots Ireland with the um, uh, for the Waterford Diocese records, and a lot of those uh, are recent, but a lot of them cut off um, at 1900 or thereabouts. Um, we have uh, prison records and um, we have court records uh, and the Petty Session Court records, which are a fantastic thing. And uh, again, I think they're all, uh, uh, Elizabeth has them safely stored away in there in the uh, National Archive. Um, and they come up to 1924, I think. Um, and there's something like 23 million individual records there uh, for the Petty Sessions Courts, which are the smallest courts in the land. So if your uh, great grandfather left uh, four pigs wander in to eat the cabbages of the man next door, um, uh, and the man next door took a bit of a, um, a hump on it. Uh, well, invariably, you may well find him uh, in there. And we all, um, we all uh, can hang our heads in shame because we will find uh, some people uh, belong to us in there, uh, drunk on the streets or, or uh, stealing firewood or something of that nature. A uh, two questions specifically in relation to the trees themselves, Tony. What's the best way? This is from Kelly. What's the best way to put step relatives or multiple spouses onto a family tree? Um, well, you see the little equal sign there that I use. Um, the way I do it is that um, if it's if a man, let's say, is married twice, uh, quite simply, I would put one equal sign on one side with. Uh, the one on the left uh, in his first marriage, and I put a little uh, one in brackets, and the one on the right hand side I put in, uh, I also uh, put in and a little number two in brackets. Sometimes, um, and I had a, a, a group of American uh, students uh, down in UCC with us during the summer school uh, there a couple of years ago, and um, we were doing family trees, and one uh, girl told me her grandmother was married seven times and how does she represent that on the family tree and uh, I asked her uh, was it um, was she Elizabeth Taylor but she wasn't Elizabeth Taylor as that but um, so I just put them one after another and so um, the man um, a god obviously uh, when it comes to it uh, he's there on the left hand side and then we have all his wives one after another one, two, three, four, five, and the little equal actually joins between them all. And that's that's actually a standard way of doing it. You will find that in, uh, in Burke's peerage and whatever. Uh, but for clarity, you know, just um, I put down the numbers there 
uh, for clarity. Um, uh, and a step brother, you know, you can do that too, uh, where, where the, obviously the, uh, the little descending line from the equal uh, comes to, um, to the correct um, father and mother. So um, if you have a stepbrother, uh, the line coming, uh, if you share a, a father, um, there should be two separate lines uh, up to the two, uh, the first wife and the second wife, whatever it is. Hey, thank you, Tony. There is a question from Helen here. How do you fit in an adopted child in a tree, di a tree diagram? And also, what is the best way to record on the tree an adopted child of a couple where this child was orphaned from a sibling of one party of the adopted couple? So, for example, perhaps a child where a parent dies and their aunt or uncle will adopt them instead. Um, yes. So it's the adopted child. What's the best way to record on the tree? where the child actually could be a niece or nephew of the, um, yes. of the couple who adopt? Um, well, um, I've had this situation and, and it, it's actually very, very uh, common in a way. And the first thing I would say is that one has to be um, very cognizant of the sensitivity of a situation. Um, if you uh, have a family tree, which is going to be shared among the wider family. Um, uh, well, you know, one thing you don't do is, is uh, start putting the uh, any family skeletons of recent origin uh, out there for the whole world to see. And, and mm -hmm. some individual's uh, life is made maybe a little bit miserable because of it. Um, uh, so you have to be uh, sensitive uh, to that. And, uh, but um, very often, uh, the information um, is there. For instance, I, I had a, a similar situation not so very long ago where um, um, uh, a child was adopted uh, by the mother's sister and, um, and reared as her child. And so um, I put the child's name under the adoptive parents and um, because she was reared as a, a sister of uh, the other brothers and sisters, uh, but she was formally adopted and uh, I put that information in there and said uh, uh, formally adopted um, and, uh, and uh, um, her birth mother was her mother's sister. And then uh, under the birth mother's name, um, I put a little note saying that their child, that her child uh, was uh, formally adopted by her sister. And uh, so when you read it, it it's clear. Um, sure. yeah. But uh, one thing I will say is that um, we should try and avoid putting factually incorrect information down. And I would rather leave information out rather than um, send someone uh, on a wild goose chase or, or, or state something that is uh, factually incorrect. For me, as a, a professional genealogist, I have to be careful that uh, you know, in all uh, things we put down there, um, whether it's on a family tree or in a genealogical report, we have to be able to stand over it and we don't want someone else coming back and saying, uh, actually, you were, uh, that's not true. Um, so mm -hmm. um, each case, I would say, is, is um, uh, has to be looked at um, in its own uh, way and um, we have to be sensitive to the people, but uh, uh, you should be able to find uh, a home there but in uh, in one case before I did I spoke with the person uh, the adoptee um, and I said to him listen here's a draft of what I'm thinking of for the family tree what do you think and uh, he looked at it and he had to think about it for a couple of minutes and he said off with you you know publish and be damned you know so uh, he was happy and uh, um, and I sh showed due regard and a bit of respect for the man you know I'm just conscious of the time, uh, Tony, yes. we're coming up just a little past 20 past seven. We might take maybe one or two more questions and sure. then wrap things up and uh, let this man have a break. Uh, um, that's okay. I, uh, I found the, the Traveller uh, family trees you've done especially poignant, particularly your uh, use discussing 
the addition or making sure that babies who died in infancy or travellers who tragically yes. took their own lives and um, that and, and in are, fairness, we don't have to yeah. we don't have to look specifically at travellers we you know we all have those stories in our in our families uh, in one shape or another uh, Ab uh, absolutely I suppose you know. what can sometimes make things a little bit more challenging is given the traditionally nomadic nature of many uh, Irish travellers in terms yes. of tra tracking them down um, and having everybody included in the in those family trees is is remarkable um, yes. and it's wonderful to hear that they have been presented to the National Library in perpetuity for the Irish people to 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 look at every, everybody for everybody to see them. Uh, that's right and actually um, we had a, a ceremony to show that and um, and uh, Dr. Sandra um, uh, Collins, the, the director of the National uh, Library, um, was wonderful on the day. And as it happens, we had uh, we had uh, two of the of the three family trees that were being presented uh, were Collins family trees. Uh, um, right. But I did re make the remark uh, that um, I, I'm not 100 percent sure if if uh, Dr. Sandra's uh, ancestors uh, would be found uh, on the traveller family trees. But I would like to think uh, that any of uh, the young children whose names are uh, written on those family trees, that in their time, uh, um, that they won't be afraid to come into the National Library of Ireland and call up for their family trees, or dare I say, um, that someday uh, a, a traveller uh, may well become uh, the director of the National Library of Ireland, and um, just uh, bringing uh, the travellers and their stories and their heritage uh, into the public domain like that um, is a very important step, and um, as I as I said, it's um, it's part of the story of Ireland, and um, and it means an awful lot uh, to the travelling community uh, to be acknowledged by official Ireland, if you like. And and Sandra uh, uh, is well known for saying um, uh, that she, it's her job uh, at the National Library to mind the story of Ireland and. Um, uh, and you know they can they can relate to that and uh, and it's great to be able to uh, to do it in that way. Oh, well, I I couldn't agree more. Um, just the the the, con the contribution of their culture to the enrichment of of everybody of yes, everybody indeed. on 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 this island. Um, Tony, one or two last quick questions. Do you use DNA results in your research? Um. DNA has become uh, um, an important part of um, the business of genealogy and the business of, dare I say, selling uh, genealogy and um, ancestry, um, the company ancestry um, has come out very, very strong in, in selling um, DNA packs and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And um, those, DNA um, um, uh, packs and uh, and DNA uh, studies, they can they can uh, leap over um, a, a huge amount of um, uh, paperwork uh, for some people. And again, we're we're back to talking about uh, people that are adopted um, and uh, finding adopted parents can be very difficult uh, going the traditional. Uh, genealogical route um, and virtually impossible in some ways uh, but a simple thing like uh, someone um, doing their DNA test and uh, putting it up on um, ancestry uh, on their database which is growing and growing every day are there several other ones uh, 23 and me is another and um, and on the other end of it um, the, it may well be that the mother of the child could be doing a DNA test or an unknown sister or brother could be doing one or a second cousin once removed um, could be doing one and um, it could provide a link between one person and another. Now, sometimes, um, you know, there, there's lots of links between lots of us and um, but uh, finding out uh, how that link works. So um, you could be uh, three generations removed from somebody, but you may not know how uh, it worked between you and them. Um, and so sometimes 
um, that's difficult. But if uh, I, I have had a situation before where, where someone uh, was told that uh, they um, that their father has a brother and um, it turns out that uh, their grandfather uh, was working in London uh, during uh, the Second World War, uh, an Irish Navy over uh, doing the work uh, that the, the, the soldiering men would usually have been doing. And uh, he was obviously, he was a married man and was playing away from home and um, uh, he left his calling card. And, uh, uh, but it came as a huge surprise to the family. Uh, but you would never find that uh, in, in a paper trail. Um, but uh, it does pop up. But um, having said all that, I personally am um, not a, a DNA a DNA expert. There are a lot of uh, people who specialize in it. Um, I don't, uh, but I do bump into it uh, all the time, um, more and more often in recent times. And um, uh, it can be a very valuable tool. But it wouldn't be a first a first port of call for someone just starting out on their family history. That's that's fair enough. Thank you, Tony. Well, on behalf of the audience, I'd like to thank you very, very much for very sharing welcome. your formidable knowledge of, of your subject with us tonight. Um, I'd like to thank the audience also for, for tuning yes, in and I for hope you're all still there. Uh, <laughs> oh, they, they are. They're, they're still sending in questions and compliments. Um, Thank you. Just a, a, a quick sidebar in relation to our next public online talk before we return to, to Tony. Um, we're pretty excited about what we have to offer you over the next three months. Um, next Thursday, the 23rd of September, we'll see the first in our autumn winter centenary lecture series which will have as its theme the key events that led to the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty on the 6th of December 1921. Um, next Thursday's talk is a collaboration between the National Archives and the National Library and is our joint contribution to the Dublin Festival of History. The talk is entitled Bring Me Into the Spotlight of a London Conference, Michael Collins from Truth to Treaty. And it will be presented by Dr. Anne Dolan of the School of History in Trinity and Dr. William Murphy, the School of History and Geography in DCU. And the talk will be moderated by RTE broadcaster David McCullough. Um, the talk will be streamed live from the National Library in Kildare Street and free tickets are available both on the NLI and the Dublin Festival of History websites. Over 500 tickets have already been booked, but there's plenty more available. They're free. So uh, do get booking and we really hope you can uh, join us on the night. But back to not, back to tonight. Um, thank you very much again, Tony and Mila Boyakas uh, for your engaging talk. To everybody who joined us from far and wide, we hope you enjoyed it. We wish you a Sorry, great uh, culture uh, night. Yes, uh, yes. Elizabeth, can I just say, um, just uh, to shout out my own, um, uh, website address, uh, of course, which is Tony Hennessy Genealogy .com. Um, you can find me there, and um, if you so desire, no, thank you, of course, Tony, uh, absolutely. Um, no, we uh, we really enjoyed uh, your, your talk. Thank you very much it was a pleasure. for taking uh, the time to speak. Pleasure and to, to be with us tonight. So, uh, Gormila Mahagwev Galer, August uh, Slongfall, thank you very, very much and enjoy your, your evenings. Slon, thank you very much. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Thanks, Evan. Thank you most kindly. Bye-bye now. Slongfall.